to meet another wonderful Chicagoan that you should know, and it's Victor Arm Armendaris. And thank you for coming today, Victor, and having this lunchtime chat with all of us. Victor well, thank you. Fabulous gallery down at uh, 300 West Superior in the city. You can see the beautiful light filled space behind Victor and that's only part of it. And we've had the pleasure of bringing groups to Victor's um, gallery. Victor has just been a wonderful friend to Art Encounter. So we're so happy to have you here today and to maybe introduce you to some of our members as well. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Sarah and Annie for having me. This is very exciting. I don't awesome. know if you're well, since COVID, we used to have so many groups coming through the gallery and uh, we just don't have as many coming through. So these opportunities to talk to people uh, through Zoom and online are just terrific for me. Well, I'm a little out of practice for speaking, though, so sometimes I have to struggle <laughs> for time. I don't get to talk all the time. I forget how. You know what? I, I started talking to myself a lot more, which is <laughs> <Me too. laughs> another interesting thing. But yes, yes, I understand. But we're so happy to, to be with you. And yeah, people are, I know are always welcome to come to the galleries and you do have openings going on. The work that you show is very varied. And that's something that we're going to look at today. So how today is going to lay out just for the next, you know, half hour, 40 minutes, however long we'll be on here is to talk with you, get to know you a little bit about, you know, your past and how you got involved in this business. And then I'm going to put up a slideshow, which will walk us through a little bit of some of the art that you show and the artists that you represent, as well as some you may recognize folks who come to Art Encounters and to Expanding Visions or Night Visions, you will have seen some of these artists. So there'll be some familiarity. So, you know, I thought let's just start before we put up the slideshow, getting to know you a little bit. Um, you grew up in California, is that right? That is true. I, well, I was actually born in Chicago, oh. uh, 1970. Uh, so I'm 52 years old. And uh, I lived here for the, about the first four to five years of my life. And then my family drove across the country and we moved to Chicago. And that's where I grew up uh, most of my life. Yeah. You're in California? Central, Central Coast, uh, Santa Barbara County, Ventura, San Luis Obispo was where I spent most of my time. And then for about the last seven years before I moved back to Chicago, I lived in Santa Barbara. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And then, so you didn't study art per se. You're not an artist. Is that is that correct? A hands you don't do your own artwork or do you? That's a complicated question. Okay. I uh, I didn't study art in a formal way. I um I was in school. I didn't really know what I wanted to do uh, since since the beginning of my education. When I was um, graduated high school, I started at a city college in San Luis Obispo. And I took a humanities course and it was eye-opening for me because it, for the first time in my life, put together history, art, and literature in one course and showed how the relationship between those three uh, subjects were so <laughs> dependent on each other. And then all of a sudden, everything clicked, everything made sense. And... Um, that was something I didn't get in high school for whatever reason. My mind wasn't on education. I was a very social person. I think I may be undiagnosed ADD or something was going on, but for whatever reason, that just didn't click. And I always had that kind of creative mind. Um, and then after that, I was an English literature major. I made art um, for myself as a young person. And I did a study of art history of my own. So very little in methods, mostly the history of art. Um, and, and then I was of course a self-taught artist because I didn't really know much about materials and was just making all kinds of crazy uh, weirdo things. Uh, so I have been on that side of the, on that side of the biz as well. When you were in the sort of developing stage of, of in that time in your life, what artists really attracted you? What turned you on? I was obsessed with uh, Dada, the Dada art movement, Duchamp, um, early Picassos, and and that sort of launched me into the history of early American art 
uh, of that period. The Surrealists were really identifiable to me. Matisse was a really early influence. And then at some point I became obsessed with Andy Warhol. And uh, I lived in Santa Barbara at that time, which is where Edie Sedgwick, his gal pal, was buried. And I was just completely having like an out of body experience where I thought I could be the next Andy Warhol, as I think every young artist believes <laughs> possibility. And I read everything that I could find on about Andy and the factory days and uh, anything he wrote, any art he created from his early design pictures uh, when he was working for like Bergdorf Goodman and doing their, their drawings all the way up through the, his entire oeuvre. So, um, so that was a huge influence on me. Uh, and then from there, things sort of, you know, just started to, you know, one thing leads to another and you start learning about other artists. Uh, one of the things I really found daunting about learning about art and, and what I was creating myself was that I would make something and then I would find another artist who did it and did it better. And I just found that to be an overwhelming um feeling of of pressure like i'll never be good enough i can never do this it's already been done there's nothing creative there's nothing new and so uh that led to my very short art career um and uh and then i ended up moving to chicago and i think uh some of my artwork was lost in the move and i changed and i just stopped creating at some point after i moved here uh, you came here in an active way did you come here in the 1990s? When did you when did you come to Chicago? I came here in 95. 95. And then um, so you first uh, from what I've what I've read um, started with um, with uh, Betsy Nathan, right? At at Pagoda Red, is that correct? So I didn't I never actually worked with Betsy, but you I had met okay. I met Betsy through my my husband, my husband and I had started dating in 1997. He was a lawyer and he was, um, at his law firm was Charlie Siskel, Gene Siskel's nephew. And Charlie and Betsy were very good friends. Chris knew that I was looking to, I was waiting tables at the time doing some side jobs in the merchandise mart with display and just really didn't have a path and was trying to, like look for my my gig, what I was gonna do. Um, and so uh, Charlie knew that and Chris arranged for me to meet Betsy. And Betsy and I started talking uh, about working together right when she was opening Pagoda Red, her, her Asian antique showroom. And she had been living in China. She'd been collecting uh, uh, containers full of gorgeous Chinese antiques and she was building her First store on Damon at the time. Um, and so, you know, we were going out to lunch over in, in Bucktown and she was kind of telling me what she wanted. I, and we just hit it off. We just got along really well. After about four or five lunch interviews, she, and I was like gung ho to work for her, she realized that what she needed was someone to do the heavy lifting work and the building and all of that kind of constructive sort of things. And what she thought I needed was to be public facing. And at the same time, her mother uh, was not happy with someone who was working with her, which was not unusual for Anne. And uh, so Betsy brought me over and I sat down and, and met Anne. Well, she must have liked you because you were there for a long time. She didn't like me. She want, didn't want, she liked me personally. She didn't want to hire me because I had no direct art experience, but I was a little persistent. And after another couple of phone calls, um, you know, I kept asking her out to coffee, which Ann Nathan would never go to coffee. She wouldn't ever leave her desk. So <laughs> she was a workaholic as I am now, but uh, I think I made her nervous because I kept Tell, telling her, well, how am I going to do this if you don't let me have a chance? And uh, I said, can I just take you out to coffee and pick your brain? And she said, I can't, I can't go to coffee. Why don't you come in and we'll have another talk? So I came in and I sat down with her and we talked and I think we were getting along because the phone rang and she looked at the phone and I 
looked at the phone and I picked it up and answered it and Nathan Gallery and that was it. I never left that day and I never left her gallery. I love that. That's yeah. something we just need to tell. Like I need to tell my kids that's how you do it. <laughs> You know? That is how you do it. You know exactly. nothing about what you're doing and you do everything wrong and then somehow it works. Exactly. Well, if you're yourself, yeah. I mean, you're so yeah. Don't listen to rules. Rules are for schmoes. Break the rules. And so you were with, you were with at Ann Nathan's for 20 years. 20 years. Yep. And I so, started with uh, her in, in 97 and then she closed in 2016. Someone wants, Diana wants to know if you know Bob Guinan. Guinan, oh yes, you know? I know Bob. I have two of his paintings on secondary market right now that I sold in the early 2000s. Bob wow. was a wonderful guy. Loved Robert Guinan. Yeah, so, he was a great guy. Well, you have so many wonderful artists. So you decided when Anne was going to be closing that it was time. What were you going to do next? You and your husband talked about and decided to open up your own gallery. Yeah, the early on, probably 10 years before um, Anne decided to retire. Um, some of the artists, I thought that I was ready to go out on my own. Um, Anne could be a very difficult person to work for. She was also one of the most inspirational people that I've ever known in my life. Um, she was a huge influence on so many parts of of my career, of my personal life. She's just a dynamic, wonderful, intelligent, smart, and tough person. Uh, and people like that can be difficult. Um, and there were there were po points when I was like, I could, I should just go and do this on my own. And some of the artists were asking, when are you going to do your own thing? I ended up saying, you know what? when the time is ready, I'm going to know. And, um, and I don't want to open up a gallery down the street from Anne and compete against her and, and have that bad blood. I'm going to stick with her. And, uh, you know, she's in her, she was in her seventies when I started working for her and she was 92 when she finally retired. So, you know, those last five years, there were some things that had happened. She had fallen and some injuries and things. And so maybe the writing was on the wall and I didn't want to upset the apple cart. And when she announced her retirement, my husband and I said, and we had actually sold our condo to prepare for setting up a business a couple of years before that. Um, and we're renting an apartment. So we had put aside some money and we said, well, when we're going to know. And as soon as she announced her retirement in the summer of 2016, we said, this is it, let's do it. And we put together a business plan uh, and uh, three months after Anne closed in 2016, we opened up in uh, 2017, March of 2017. So, um, so yeah, as we were closing Anne, we were also uh, opening Gallery Victor. So it was happening all very quickly. Wow, that must have been an incredible time for you. A lot of work. It was exciting. It was nonstop um, and uh, an absolute, it, you know, seems like everything just came together very organically. Well, it's a beautiful space and you guys can see some of what's behind Victor, but it's huge. It's, there's so much more in that gallery space. So you definitely have to go and see it in person. Let me share my screen, Victor, and then we can talk a little bit about sure. I and the kind of artists that you're attracted to representing and whatnot. Mm -hmm. so bear with me yes. for a moment. Yes, when of course. Here. And and that lovely woman behind me is Yolanda from Carl Hammer Gallery. She's visiting. Oh, oh we know. Yeah, Yolanda. Hello, Yolanda. <laughs> yes. Tell her it's Art Encounter. That's Yolanda, I'm on with Art Encounter. Yeah, who knows? She knows you guys. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. We were planning to go over to Carl Hammer, and then there was a little COVID outbreak, so we weren't able to get there last winter. Oh, bummer. They were kind enough to set up something at into it for us. So, all right. So here we see a handsome picture of yourself and another one with your husband, uh, Christopher Clark, who's your yep. business partner. Yep. And this is a lovely pic. I love this picture, just looking in through the window. Um, we were um, lucky enough when we came to uh, visit you, which was the summer that we were, things had opened up um, during the pandemic. Was that 
was that 21? I don't even remember, 20, 21, who knows anymore? I think it was 21. Um, and you had uh, Wesley Kimmel, Kimmler up. So some of you guys who were there may recognize this. It was when we were venturing out in public for the first time. And I just put up a, a couple slides here just to show the various artists that um, Victor uh, represents. And you can see there's a lot. And just to kind of take a little bit of a look at um, maybe what attracts Victor, if you can, you know, we're not looking at pure abstraction here, very, very realistic. Um, you may be familiar, some of you came on Expanding Visions to see Bruno Cerdo's work. These are a couple uh, pieces by Bruno Cerdo. Um, we had a wonderful time visiting his studio. Um, this gentleman is Mark Bowers. I actually hosted him in one of our online night visions programs. What a great guy um, who is an art teacher at, at, I believe at New Trier and also an artist, his beautiful work. And in his work, I really see you were talking about, you know, your interest in, in surrealism and you see that in, in a lot of, of the people that you, you carry um, and the extreme realism. Um, we went to John Soyberg's. Um, some of you folks came with us and that was quite an experience at John's house. On Expanding Visions. Yes, for Expanding Visions, absolutely. And that was last uh, spring, I wanna say. And we saw some of Helen O's work at some collector's homes on Lakeshore that you, you sell to. She's a beautiful painter. Um, and th this is, so you also um, represent uh, Jim Rose and these are some of his furniture pieces. You wanna tell people about what he um, makes these out of? Uh, Jim works in steel, mostly found and salvaged steel. And uh, he graduated, many people are familiar with Jim's work. He graduated from the Art Institute in the early 90s. And he's been making this furniture for almost 30 years. He started doing shaker furniture and steel, which was uh, naturally rusted shipbuilding steel. He would buy scrap and great big sheets and then create shaker furniture. Uh, he stopped running out of that rust steel and then um, at the same time had seen a show of the G's Bend quilts from Alabama. So all of these patterns that you see in the cabinets are made from found salvaged steel cut with all original color. So he doesn't do any painting. This is what, what happens when steel sits out in the sun and the elements and fades and, and mars. Just like old fabric in a quilt, he uses old steel to create the quilt pattern. So you have all that character of the steel. And then the, like um, these are directly taken from the G's Bend quilts of Alabama, very famous American uh, quilts. Well, they're incredibly beautiful. I think when we were there, one of our um, participants who came with Expanding Visions actually was purchasing a piece from you. And I can see why they would want yes. to. They're beautiful in the photo, but in person, absolutely stunning. The materials really sing when you when you see how they're yeah. um, And when you think of steel, you think of cold and hard and kind of rough. These have such a warmth to them. It's, it's a very arresting thing. Absolutely. I did put up, so when we were just looking at, this is a piece by Marco Soraya that you um, are just to finish to show with at the uh, gallery. We were fortunate enough to have some of his pieces in our in our gala um, auction this last mm -hmm. spring. And um, what attracts you to, to his work and also with the work in general? I mean, that's such a, you know, personal question, but, and it's also very broad, but I think you were, you were able to kind of distill it down what kind of work that you're attracted to and that you want to, what well, makes you want to represent somebody. Marcos Raya, uh, we still actually have a show up of Marcos Raya. Oh. We did an, an installation inspired by um, his studio for Dia de los Muertos. So okay. it is uh, kind of a Day of the Dead inspired uh, uh, installation here at the gallery. And it's just terrific. It's a, it's a kind of a hidden behind a wall and you walk through a curtain and you walk into this kind of magical room filled with his stuff. And what attracts me to Marcos um, is he's such a great 
image maker. And he's very diverse in his materials. For those people who remember the piece that he donated to the uh, auction, uh, that was a study for a piece that I have a full-size painting here at the gallery. Um, and that's Charlie. He's, we, he, I'm sorry. Uh, he right. is um, is very diverse in his materials. He's influenced by Mexican folk art, uh, by the Chicago Imagists. You see a little bit of Paschke in his work. You see a little bit of um, a lot of other art influence in his work. But he takes those influences and he does something completely his own. Um, and I I love just how mixed and forward thinking his work is. It's at the same time referencing the past, but it's also futuristic um, and, and surreal. How big is this, is this piece? That's about, uh, it's small, it's a collage. Uh, he uh, did a painting of this much larger, but this is the original paper collage and it's about two feet by three feet maybe at the most. How big does he paint when he does his paintings? Sorry. Very large. Um, some of his paintings are maybe eight by 12 feet. Um, you know, he's one of the original muralists on the south side of Chicago. And, um, you know, so he was accustomed to painting big and large. And his work does go to that scale. I. I've yet to do, and what we're talking about is to do a full size exhibition of Marcos's work in the gallery. So far, I, I only started representing him last, uh, earlier this year, sorry, he was in our show in January. And I've included him in several shows, but we've yet to do a full scale Marcos Raya show. So that's coming up in 23 or 24. Beautiful. You know, I, you, you, tend to have a very strong attraction to highly skilled, highly realistic artwork. And there's always something very evocative in it that really pulls you in. So it's not just because it's, you know, beautiful or familiar. There's, there's, I find with the work that you carry it's such an emotional reaction that I get. And I'm assuming that's how something that goes into your choosing it as well, um, that has to move you in some way in order to want to represent the artist. Or your feelings of others? Yeah, there's no question. And um, having just returned from a trip to Italy in September, my first uh, trip to Italy, where I went to Venice, Florence, and Rome, my uh, attraction to figurative work is stronger than ever. Um, and I, I love to see um, the hand of the artist. I do like traditional uh, drawing, but but we all know that that's been done before and over and over many times. So when I'm looking at an artist's work, I look for something that takes the, the medium and pushes it forward. I wanna see it now and in the future, and I wanna see it connected to the past at the same time. Uh, Mary Boardman, who you have on the screen right now is a perfect example. There's also three of those pieces hanging behind me on the wall so you can get a sense of the scale of her work. And Mary um, works in one material, charcoal. Her tool is an eraser. She spends up to a year or more on one piece. So this was worked on for over a year, the one you're looking at. And mm -hmm. that those two very simple materials are just pushed and molded and pressed and sculpted into what you see in her final thing. And it goes beyond, you know, just the technical aspect. Her work has a psychological strength and a depth. Um, you feel when you're standing in front of them, this universal human connection. And that I think just, uh, it, her work just elevates everything it's around and it itself is elevated. She's a totally unique in the art world. And that is exactly what I look for when I'm looking for something. So it's a traditional, drawing it's a face it's a portrait but it's taken all of that beyond what you can imagine and and for anybody who stood in front of her work you feel that power uh and when you're in a room with them you feel the presence of of her of her work when you're looking at anything you know i started um uh with a very strong attraction towards 
abstraction, uh, the abstract expressionist. One of my favorite artists is Franz Klein. Uh, I love Rothko. I love all of that. And I do show some abstraction, but I can't help but be attracted to the figure. And part of when I look at that as well, I can go into a section of that and I see the hand of the artist. I see the mark making. Uh, and it is all abstraction in the end. You're only just looking at marks on, on canvas or on paper done with mud and, and basic materials and their artists are creating images. True, it's just how much, how condensed are those marks, right? I, I love what, how yes. you describe that, but you're absolutely right. And especially, you know, you always go up closer to a painting and further away and the abstraction becomes as you get closer and closer. So For sure. You always yeah. think about how it, it comes into focus as you go further away, but that whole idea of turning that on its side, you know, turning it on its head and getting closer mm -hmm. and finding the abstraction, it's really interesting. Um, yeah. Not, well, I was I was looking through, you know, on your website, different shows that you've had up, and they're so diverse, uh, but they're so um, impel, you know, impelling at the same time, compelling. Sorry, see, mm -hmm. it's not learning words. Um, this was really a moving uh, show that you had. This was before, I'm assuming, just before the Marcus Raya. Uh, yeah, this yeah. was our yeah. September. Uh, fall opening show. Well, William Blake, not the poet and who you might be familiar with. This is a young artist. He's 31. And William does a uh, civil war reenactment um, in life. He's been doing that since he was a teenager. The work in this show was based on a reenactment that he arranged at Gettysburg. So he worked with uh, retired and active Marines and they created a reenactment, a civil war battle it was actually a reenactment of a 1922 um, reenactment. So there's lots of layers of reenactment in his right. work. Uh, and it's, it's kind of a complicated thing, but the, 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 um, the basis of his work uh, is, is started well before any paint hits the canvas. He participates in reenactments as, um, as, uh, Winslow Homer. So when he's in a reenactment, he is em embodying Winslow Homer, who was there during the Civil War on the battlefield doing uh, drawings and paintings for Harper's Weekly magazine because he was an artist correspondent. And so he would be there with his press pass on the field and depicting the war for Americans so they could see what were, was happening. Um, and so William Blake is is Winslow Homer. And you see that influence in his work. Uh, you see his connection to the history of art. That first painting you held up was uh, Deposition of Christ by Pontormo, or I actually think more accurately, the Caravaggio Deposition of Christ. The one we just had up was the Pietà, Michelangelo's Pietà done in painting. Um, you see Winslow Homer's work in his, in his paintings. We had some in the show that were Manet inspired. He's taking the history of art, applying the Civil War to it, but there's this, this connection also to what's happening today. As you look at his paintings in the backgrounds, you'll see monuments. So we know this isn't a Civil War painting. The monument is already there. This is today. And that conversation, everything that was happening in the Civil War is still happening today. And we see it happening in the riots on our streets, in the Black Lives Matter movement. That uh, unresolved conflict is ongoing. And that's what his work is talking about, a connection to the history of art, to the history of our country, and to the present of our country in order to have a discussion about the Do future you need to of come our back? country. No, I'm going to Can you use um, Diana, please? Annie, thank you. All right. They're outstanding, those paintings and the sense of not knowing, you know, what's real when you look at them because of that layered history. And the way you're able to really express it and add so many, I mean, the painting itself offers so much narrative and such beauty and pain. And what, what you've offered to us, that's why I totally urge people to come into your gallery and also get um, some understanding about these artists from you. You speak so well. You should really 
you should really teach Victor in, in all your spare time. So <laughs> well, good. there's, you know, there's an element of, I, I don't often like to say too much about the painting. I do because it's enjoyable and it, and it, it is interesting. What the real relationship that the collector has with the painting or you do when you go to a museum is to spend time with it over time all of that will reveal itself to you whether it does it quickly or over your entire lifetime and when looking at a painting it's not a one shot look at it it's nice it's not nice walk away and go you have to spend time when an artist is is painting they're writing a novel they're not doing it in a book form with lots of pages. They're doing it with every single mark they make, every decision they make about the figure. And it is our job as the viewer to decode that. And that happens as you bring your own life experience to the painting, as the painting then makes you ask questions about your life and you go out into the world asking those questions and learn more. And, and all of that is there when time is spent. You're right. It's it's like reading a good book. You don't need to have the crypt notes, you know. You you, you want exactly. to read it and be yeah. with it, and it needs yeah. to speak yeah. for itself, and it, it it does. And that's you know, having the stories is always kind of interesting, extra tidbits like taking an art history class. But at the yeah. same time, if the work isn't fully there, then you know what's the point? You um, did a, a beautiful show here for um, during also during Gay Pride Month. Um, mm -hmm. up in your gallery and we can see that a little bit of the space and, and here's um, some beautiful painting with the flesh tones or I mean just talk about abstraction if you go into to some of those areas. Um, yeah this is an interesting young artist Rick Sint who um, he's a queer artist uh, self-identified and he um, based this work and based much of his work on gay pornography. So very uh, graphic sexual images, but as he's as he's looking at those images, he's pulling in intimate views, and his work is about uh, moments of intimacy that you can find in this pornography, which for him, as he describes it, was his entree into learning about himself. Um, you know, coming from a society that was forcing him into the closet. This is how he learned about intimacy through through these films. And through his work, he finds things that are very poignant and romantic within that within that material. Yeah, when I was looking at the pictures, there are definitely there's some a certain amount just intimacy, but tenderness within the intimacy. So if you didn't yes. know it from pornography, you might not feel that. And also the warmth and the colors and, and just the way the, the way he's frozen sort of those moments, but because they're less than photographic looking, there's also that feeling like there's movement in it as well. They're, 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 very, they're very beautiful. But here's come something different as well. So the boys of summer are right here in your, your gallery. <laughs> Yes, so, this is um, Margie Lawrence. Margie is a lifelong uh, baseball and Cubs fan, grew up here in Chicago, and her work is really about nostalgia of baseball and that sort of love of the sport. And she loves and hates the Cubs at the same time and knows everything about them. Uh, and these are based on um, some famous and some obscure photographs that she uh, repaints in watercolor and changes and makes her own. Wow. beautifully done beautiful hand in they're her lovely. work yeah, they're, they're lovely the depth and there is just beautiful it was but i wanted also people to see that you have quite a variety within you know figurative and somewhat realistic art that you that you show and the artists that you represent and then you go back again into some of the surrealism who, who is this artist this is rose frameth frazier and uh, this is some of her most recent work. I'm not sure that I quite understand what Rose is doing in some of this recent work, but there, she's a beautiful painter. And uh, I'm still, I'm still uh, uh, struggling with some of these images. Well, I do have, love them. You have to live with it for a lifetime. You do, absolutely. And let no it question about itself. it. Um, yeah. but no, it's, it's quite beautiful. And then I have just a couple more slides. You have this fabulous show that unfortunately I missed in person this past uh, spring. I think Joanna, you went, didn't you? Yes, I did. It was great. 
So tell us about um, the show a little bit. And then I've got just a couple of the miniature rooms too that I can show, but what was your, um, tell us about your cabinet of curiosities. Sure, this was our um, show we opened in January of this year. I think it was the longest running show I've put up. I, I was uh, so much went into setting this up. I think we took two or three weeks to transform the gallery. And for anybody who went and saw it, uh, the gallery was turned into a walkthrough cabinet of curiosities. And there were probably 70 artists in that show. Um, the walls were filled floor to ceiling. The, there was uh, carved out uh, hallways that you would walk and wander through. And it was also our fifth anniversary show. So in order to celebrate our fifth anniversary, we did something really captivating and fun and little kinky and bizarre. And uh, there's a wall, you're looking at an entire wall installation of Marcos Raya's work. So we did basically a recreation of his own studio, which is a, of Wunderkammer. And it was also the first show where we introduced the, um, the miniature rooms by the Cupjack family who um, who worked with Mrs. Thorne on the rooms at the Art Institute. The father, Eugene Cupjack, um, was Mrs. Thorne's main craftsperson who set up all of those rooms there at the Art Institute and sort of coordinated all the different craftspeople uh, and made her vision come to life. And then his two sons, Hank and Jay, continued on making miniatures. Um, so we... Uh, started showing those in the Wunderkammer throughout the space, and now they have a semi-permanent installation here at the gallery um, wow. where we, we feature them. And they're really so extraordinary. Anybody who's seen the Thorn Rooms at the Art Institute knows um, and never forgets them. If you get the chance to go out to Lake Forest, Lake Bluff History Center, they have an extraordinary show up uh, that goes into the new year of uh, miniature rooms. We loaned five pieces there, but the curator pulled together some very early, never seen uh, thorn pieces of paper, some of her early rooms. There's some other miniaturists in that show and they just wrote a terrific uh, copy if you wanna learn about the history of miniatures in general and especially thorn rooms. That's incredible. Now you also have a room in your gallery um, that you, Remind me, it's called the studio. The studio, yes. Do you have that in the, the space where you, or, or have you, are you not? I have, the, I have the spirit of the studio in the gallery okay. and I have the work here, but um, because we're not getting the foot traffic and that room really requires that kind of foot traffic to keep wow. uh, going. Uh, I've chosen to dismantle it. It's actually where I have the Thorn miniature rooms right now. Okay. And it was sort of like lower priced things, more like a cash and carry kind of area. If someone wanted to it, come in and only had a hundred dollars to spend, they could come and find something they loved and, you know, or what. The idea is still active. It, it came right. from my early years, starting with Anne when I was, um, uh, 27 years old, didn't really have any art and was was sort of like, well, how am I ever going to have a collection like you? And Anne said, buy one piece a year and in 10 years, you'll have a collection. And she was absolutely right. And I continue to do that to this day, usually more than one. But um, but that room was was set up for for young people, new collectors to have something of very high quality. Uh, great interest and we kept all the pricing on that work under two thousand dollars some of the pieces were a hundred dollars you know which right. pretty much anybody could could make work in. and it was things people would sometimes pay out a hundred dollars over three months and I didn't care I was like just get the art get it into your home get it into your hands and it will change well, your you, life it'll change your world it does what makes you special Victor is that you really want to see people being able to live with and enjoy and start collecting. And you're so open to that spirit of- No question. And I wanna go back to them in 20 years and have them and have it still look as good as it did when they bought it and to still be relevant. That's the most important too. Absolutely. So I have two more questions 
Well, we'll make it quick because I know we're about to wrap up and I know people may have a couple questions for you, but just maybe just give a little shout out to you started um, doing some things during the pandemic that helped promote some of your work. I know you're on artsy and first dibs and things like that. So just like a, yeah. a of explanation, a little pivot or how people can find you if they can't come into the gallery and, and find people that you represent. Your, the sure. Well, you if you're local, our website is really the most excellent way to look up the artist to sort of figure out what you want, but that's only a beginning tool. Uh, and visiting the gallery is invaluable, but when you're, when you're here, you're really only seeing 10 to 20% of the inventory. There's a whole other life. It's like an iceberg. You're seeing the tip. There's an entire berg underneath of, of artwork that we draw from. And the success for us, I think, throughout the pandemic and continuing to this day is that we carry a large inventory. I represent a lot more artists than most galleries. I have a, over 70 artists um, in my stable. Um, some of them create one piece a year, as we know, but some are a little more productive. And um, and so when you're going through and looking at, at these different things, you can always shoot me an email and say, I love the work of so-and-so. What else do you have? And, and this is my price range, or this is my wall. And you can, you know, that's the kind of business that I've been doing uh, through the pandemic because people aren't coming in to the gallery as much anymore. Um, we are on first dibs. That was invaluable to us in those, in that first year, especially during COVID when our physical space was closed and we were selling online all over the world to China, to Germany, to Australia, uh, Puerto Rico. I was shipping things coming into the gallery just to pack and ship different artworks, photograph and do all of that. And then Artsy has become a very valuable resource. Uh, you can follow our artists on Artsy and then every time we post something new, it lets you know. So you're constantly getting refreshed with, with new work or you'll know what's happening out there. And you can follow, I mean, Artsy has tons of galleries, so that's a great resource. A-R-T-S-Y, yeah. My last question, and then maybe we can open it up for three or four questions, and then we are going to finish our lunch hour and move on with the rest of our day. But my, um, my last question is, you know, what's coming up? I, I had thought that this last show, um, that the Raya show was uh, uh, done. So what's, what's, what's the next show coming? It what was you, done, but I decided to hold it over. So it's up for another month. <laughs> oh, okay, another month. So it's going to go through December. Well, it's going to go through December. Um, what's happening next is what's happening now. And that is <laughs> our current show is um, work that arrived in, in 2022. So in the last six months, you know, I've had show after show after show. And I was like, I need to be free for a little bit. And I just want to show some of these artists who haven't had a show and maybe they don't have enough work to have a show, but let's put up a couple of their pieces. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to toot my own horn because I pick really strong quality artwork. I can show them all together, even though they're very different and they don't look like you're looking at a mess of stuff. Everything is of the same level of quality, so it all can stand next to each other. And uh, we're actually transforming the gallery over these last two days. We, we had a nice group up for November, and now for the rest of December, we're transforming again. But it's all uh, fresh, exciting, beautiful work. Um, and so that's we're continuing through the rest of the year. In January and February, I'll be featuring Ben Duke in the gallery. Uh, large scale, really dynamic paintings. Um, and we're gonna continue showing this group group work. So it's a, a multi-pronged event. And then for the new year, I have some terrific shows planned with Art Shea and his son, Richard Shea. Uh, I have uh, one of the Cubs players um, did a uh, collaboration with an English artist on you know Wrigley Field from the point of view of one of the players. So you do great, um, uh, baseball themed photos and then also he's doing some some urban um, thing not photos paintings uh, some urban things and so there's some good things coming up in the new year as well wonderful we never stop here truly every time you come stop. in it's different you need I'm, a vacation I'm a I, I was in Italy 
<laughs> that was right. working vacation. <laughs> well, I'm wondering when you're going to have the Victor Armanderas, you know, Gallery Florence. God, oh, let's do it. I'll rent an apartment. <laughs> I will come in. Sorry, Art Encounter. I'll come in. Um, let's all do it. Yeah, yeah, I love it there. I um, love it there. Who doesn't love it there, right? Who doesn't love it there? Oh, we're doing a show in Palm Springs in February as well. So I'll be traveling oh, to Palm Springs. Wonderful. Yeah. So let's open it up. Does anybody have a question? Um, we, maybe we can take uh, five minutes of questions and then- Dana, Dana just asked what the website is. Oh, website is galleryvictor.com. G-A-L-L-E-R-Y-V-I-C-T-O-R.com. Beautiful. It's a beautiful website. Yes, go ahead, Susan. Thank you. Uh, I bought a piece from uh, Ann Nathan, Ann, Ann Poole. Do you remember uh, Amy her? Poole. Amy Lowry Amy Poole. Poole. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. Great artist. Yes. Yeah. You might have hung it in paper. my home. <laughs> oh, I probably did. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Her work is beautiful. Ann had She's, wonderful artists. Is she still working? Uh, Amy, Amy I haven't seen or talked to her in a long time because I don't show her work, but I believe she is still creating. She spends uh, half of the year or part of the year in Chicago and then she's out east uh, in a gorgeous, uh, I think it's in Maine. I think she has a place in Maine. So yeah, she has a wonderful life. So maybe on the Cape Cod, but I haven't talked to Amy in years, not since Diana? I've opened my own gallery. Diana, you have your hand up? Uh, yes, I have two questions, actually. I was kind of riffing through your website as you were um, describing the works that you carry. And so one question that I have is if there's an artist that I see that I'm interested in that you aren't exhibiting right now, should I just call ahead and say, I'd like to see this artist's works when I come in? That's Absolutely. That, that, that's the best way. And just, only as a politeness to me, So because our storeroom, we... My one flaw about this space is I don't have a large storeroom and sometimes right. it's difficult to pull things out on the spur. So if I have a time ahead of time, I can pull everything out so it's ready when you arrive. And then are, I'm not are you sweating an, when we're talking. Are you, are you in Ann Nathan's old space? No, we're a block away. We're okay. a block west, right and at the, uh, where the Chicago L line is, we're one, one in from the corner where the stairs then, come down. I don't, I don't want to hog the time, but I'm going to ask you this question anyway. You mentioned that you have two of Bob Dynan's paintings. You still I have do. them? Okay. I have two. They're secondary market pieces. So I sold them years ago in the collector. I have a portion of their collection as they're downsizing. Uh, so I have a, some, and they were excellent collectors. So I have no no problem taking works like that. And then okay. to home. Yeah. Good, good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anybody else? Carol, you might want to unmute and then we can hear your question. Um, yeah. Did, did Ann Nathan ever see your gallery? Yes, she's been here numerous times. In fact, she came once during COVID, which was terrifying. <laughs> her daughters brought her in uh and you know, the gallery was closed and she kept wanting to hug but uh we were all afraid for her health <laughs> but uh she's been here several times yes um and she loves it of course well many of the artists she knows i have a question in the chat which is how do you handle charcoal because it's so delicate I don't handle it. The artists handle it. I just frame it and handle it very carefully once it's framed. And Susan Gottlieb, you have your hand up. What's the work behind you? Is it trees? Uh, a, or? Oh, that is a fabulous new artist. So even though I have too many artists, if if someone comes in and, and I just love their work, um, they find their way in. And this is Mary Block. Mary is, uh, she's been around for a long time in Chicago. She's not really been represented a lot, but she, uh, she did a sculpture on the, um, the, uh, America, or the Bar Association building downtown. She's a sculptor and a photographer. And these are uh, photos 
but they're created like a collage, many thousands of images and lots of, of pulling together things. When you see them in person, they're very dimensional. And then I'm just going to back up here. You see that big cat in the window? That's also her work. That's a sculpture of a cat. Wow. Really worth seeing. She just oh, brought okay. these in yesterday. We're just starting to work together. Yeah. I Powerful. We uh, we'll take one question from Freda, and then I think we will be done with our lunchtime. Not a question, just a comment. We love our Jim Rose table. Oh, oh. goody, 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 <laughs> yes. Jim was here yesterday. I'm so happy you have one. You both have great taste. Those are beautiful. And, um, then, and I would just like to invite everybody to come to the gallery at any time. I'm about to send out an email. We're serving uh, little goodies and, and refreshments for the rest of December as you come by. So you can be casual and have a coffee or a cocktail and, and hang out and look at the art. Uh, everything is worth seeing in person. I have one comment, which is that Victor is absolutely one of the friendliest dealers <laughs> in town. It is always a joy to go to your gallery. Thank you, Absolutely. Joanna. Thank you.